Hello again. Here are some notes I wrote on the 2nd of October 2008. I wonder whether it is ever theoretically possible to be still. We are on the surface of a planet revolving at 900 miles an hour and orbiting the Sun at 19 miles per second. Obviously, I've been listening to the Galaxy song by Monty Python before I wrote this. I now know those numbers are approximations. Um, Anyway, what I wrote after that was The Sun itself is orbiting the centre of the Milky Way galaxy which takes 300,000 years to go round It's actually more like 220,000 No, what am I talking about? I don't even know what I said back then I'm going to start that sentence again The Sun itself is orbiting the centre of the Milky Way galaxy which takes 300 million years to go round And the correction I would like to make is that it's closer to 220 million years. Our galaxy and Andromeda, brackets our closest neighbour, are due to collide in about a, mil a billion years, I think. But most other galaxies are receding from us. If outer space is a virtual vacuum, then it matters not whether one is in motion or not. You will always be in motion relative to some objects and possibly still if you're moving at the same velocity and direction as other objects. This is written at the time I was just starting to look into relativity, so I was still pretty ignorant about um, Einstein's theories. It's amazing how much we have worked out based on a tiny window of observation in both space and time. As time goes by, greater accuracy is achieved and sometimes previous ideas are overturned. It will be fascinating to see what else is discovered in the future. I just hope that the stupid element of humanity doesn't destroy the future for the rest of us. We are so lucky to be alive and so lucky to be humans. From primitive beginnings we have created a sense of morality. We rise above our biological makeup and have become frighteningly powerful. I can envisage some religion as an attempt by fairly far-sighted humans to control slightly more gullible humans and curtail their destructive behaviour. An older human can ponder upon the stupidity of younger humans and might try to modify their behaviour without them realising the source of the guidance. By, by manipulating their beliefs through the use of punishment and reward. I'm hungry to learn. I'm waking up, not necessarily in the spiritual sense of the world, but literally becoming more aware of the world in which I find myself. Science in its pure form, not affiliated with business interests, but as an objective an analyzer of facts and pursuer of the truth, is the best way to make sense of the world. I think. It sounds so simple, yet I used to be much more confused about the subject. It sounds so simple, yet I used to be much more confused about the subjectiveness of, of observation, and ultimately what the concept truth actually means, whether is something whether something is real or not, and then that kind of leads you on to, well, what does real mean? And then you really can get bogged down in semantics. But that's me adding my tuppence worth now in 2012 to something I wrote in 2008. This next bit is, um, oh, it's a lot of numbers, really, um, which I wrote down after having watched uh, Richard Dawkins' Christmas lecture from, I think, 1991, and um, he was uh, speaking to a theatre full of school children and explaining uh, some science and evolution. Very interesting, these Christmas lectures. I think they used to be on the BBC, but uh, not anymore. And what he said... Um, and I thought this was a mistake, so I wanted to check it. One of the things he got the kids to do was to uh, get some very large bits of paper, presumably from, uh, you know, blank newspaper, and fold them in half, 
fold them in half again, fold them in half again, and on that basis, uh, I think the, the, the general idea is that it's, it's difficult to fold a piece of paper in half more than about eight times. It becomes very hard to bend it after that. But if you could keep folding them in half and keep folding them in half, how many times, or how, how thick would the stack of paper be after you folded it 50 times? Um, and he asked this question to the audience, no, I don't think anybody knew, and then he came out with the answer, thicker than the known universe. And I was thinking, only 50 times? Can that be right? So I started to um, uh, do the calculation myself on the basis of an Argos catalogue, which has quite thin paper, um, is approximately approximately a thousand pages thick. I had an Argos catalogue and it was um, about a uh, couple of inches thick. And I worked out that if you f folded the uh, paper in half uh, and then doubled it and doubled it and doubled it and doubled it, once you'd doubled it 67 times, it would be more than one light year thick, which a light year is a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the size of the known universe. Um, so, anyway, I'll read what I wrote here, and uh, rather than trying to remember it all, and then refresh my memory that way. If you fold a piece of paper, then fold it again so it's twice, then four times as thick, and continue folding it so it doubles in thickness each time you fold it. 67 times it is thicker than a light year. Mind-boggling numbers. Multiplying by 10 each time gets you there much sooner. Richard Dawkins must have meant that when he said thicker than the known universe. I read that the estimated distance across the universe, the universe, I read that the estimated distance across the universe is 10 to the 46 times greater than the nucleus of an atom. That's a number one with 46 zeros. It's easy to write 10 to the 50 or 10 to the 100, but after a point there is nothing big enough for these numbers to relate to, and you never get close to infinity or eternity. If you think I'm wrong, I don't really understand why exactly I wrote this, but, but I don't know who I was writing it to, but I'll read it anyway. If you think I'm wrong, please tell me where I've gone wrong. If I'm right about God not being real, then maybe that is worth listening to. I spent so long looking for skyhooks, but found cranes instead and realised the futility of looking for skyhooks. I think I must have wrote that um, after reading one of Daniel Dennett's book, Daniel Dennett's books, because the concept or the idea of cranes and skyhooks are something which he came up with a, a useful analogy for um, the, the difference between something logical and rational and something superstitious. A skyhook obviously um, doesn't work. A hook, the, there is no, nothing in the sky to hook the thing onto. Anyway, I don't need to explain that. But uh, that's all I'm going to read for now. Um, see you next time if you find this stuff remotely interesting.